Again, welcome, welcome everybody. Oh, loud? Okay. So welcome everybody to this talk. This talk is about um, giraffe, but um, more in general, it's a talk about um, the challenges of running those algorithms on big graphs and across multiple machines. So we will try to have a look at the challenges uh, for particular tasks to, do, to justify and uh, understand a bit the architecture of giraffe and Kragen. Oh yes, uh, the interesting thing, but I was pretty lucky to be the first speaker, well not very lucky considering the hour, but uh, I, was, I was afraid to be speaking after guys from Heyman and Dobenor, so repeating what they were saying, but apparently on the first one, which is good for me and for you, but also for them, because there's a lot of overlap between the three projects, basically what I would speak about, holds for, for them 100%, so good news for everybody. Um, I will speak about Giraffe because I'm a member of the team and I'm most interested in um, graph processing on a scale. Um, so that's it with the introduction. I, um, I prepared a sentence to, to take home, let's say, also it's at, the, it's at the beginning. But um, it's also an outline for the talk, for the content uh, I will be talking about. And the sentence goes like this. Uh, Giraffe is the rules implementation of Pregel. Is a distributed graph processing framework complementary to MapReduce is not well suited for graph algorithms. So basically, the idea is we will try to I will try to split this sentence back into the original ones, take it from the last one. So why is not MapReduce very well suited for or for graphs? And then we'll see the, justify the decisions for Pregel and, and check out the architecture of Giraffe as an implementation of Pregel. So let's start from MapReduce um, and see how. PageRank can be implemented. As we know, uh, PageRank is a can be can be expressed as an alternative graph algorithm, which means that we have an initial value that is fine-grained iteration after uh, iteration. And in terms of MapReduce, it means we have a, a pipeline of MapReduce jobs repeated one after the other, where the output of the first or previous job gets to be input for the next one, and so on and so forth. So we'll have a quick look at uh, what happens in one of these particular MapReduce jobs. So, I think it's the same stuff for all the jobs. Okay. Um, so, let's start with the input graph. We have a, hopefully a big graph. We can think of a web graph or a blog or something. Where we have vertices, which are pages or blocks. Uh, they are uniquely identified by the URL. And uh, if vertex has uh, an outgoing edge for another page, if there is an HR app, there is a link in the HTML from one page to the other. So, we take um, each of these vertices, and we ser deserialize this graph into a big HTML file. Of course, it's a list of uh, k value pairs. So, so that we have tuples, each vertex is a tuple, and the key of this tuple of this pair is the vertex ID, so the URL, and the <coughs> value which is a composite object. So the page rank value for that vertex, and the adjacency list for that vertex, so all the other vertices that this vertex is pointing to, right? So the URLs for the pages I have a link to in my own page. For example. So we serialize this, this big graph this way into HDFS, and HDFS under the hood splits it and, and spreads it across um, the data nodes in the MapReduce on the Hadoop cluster. So now that we have uh, our <coughs> vertices spread across the cluster, we can run the mapper on each of them one at a time. So the first, what, what the, the duty for the mapper is to compute the partial page rank value for that vertex. And the first, the, the partial page rank value is computed by taking the first one, which is one at the beginning, and divided it by the number of neighbors it has, because it spreads proportional to the number of, uh, of neighbors. So we, we iterate through all the neighbors of that vertex, and we some kind of, we, we emit, well, we emit an um, intermediate pay, uh, pair, where the key is the, the neighbor vertex, so we basically send our contribution to their page rank uh, by emitting these intermediate k value pairs. <coughs> along with this uh, k value pairs from the computation, we also pass along the graph, the, the static part of the graph, so the topology, this adjacency list, uh, along with, from the mapper to the reducer in order to be drawn <coughs> together later, as we will see. So we're passing both the values and the graph from mapper to the reducer. And while we are emitting these intermediate k value pairs, we are uh, spilling to local disk, and the data is sorted, uh, and then later sent to the reducer, uh, 
uh, by to the shuffle and sort phase, uh, where the data hits the disk again to be merged and to be sent le fed later to the reducer. So now the reducer for each vertex will have, uh, well, of course the key will be the vertex, and the values will be the list of these partial uh, page rank values we, we have sent for the mappers, which can be just added up in a sum and joined together with, uh, with uh, the static, <coughs> static part of the graph we, uh, we sent from the mapper. So we have the new page rank values, we have the, well, the, the, the static part of the graph, we join them together, we substitute the old, old page rank values with the, with the new ones, and we can produce the input file uh, again with this updated, updated um, page rank vector. And we can start the next following job. So basically the idea is, is very simple. Uh, the thing is that this process happens n times. Uh, and n times is a um, user-defined parameter, so it can be usually a big number. And <coughs> it depends on the algorithm, but uh, the drawbacks of this approach for map producer basically can be, let's say, summarized in these four points. We have n jobs, so we have to hit n times the cost of the job bootstrap, which is at least 30 seconds. Uh, we're hitting the disk for whether for reading or for writing at least six times during the job. So we're reading the, uh, the file from log from disk. We are writing uh, the map output, so reading again to send it to the reducer, who write it down and read it again just to give it to the reducer for writing to six times the output of the job. It's a lot of I.O., although it's, of, of course, optimized and sequential. Also, we are sorting the data between the mapper and the reducer, which is not um, taken advantage of during reducer so it's kind of useless at the moment for many uh, jobs um, and we have this fourth component which is uh, we're passing the static static part of the graph from the input to the output so there's a lot of network IO as well which is kind of unnecessary because that's an immutable part of the graph so considering these particular four aspects which are uh, some kind of orthogonal to all the graph algorithms. We have the same problem, for example, with um, single source shortest path problem, where we have a vertex, where we try to compute the distance from this vertex to all the others. So in this kind, in this kind of situation, the number of, jo the number of jobs depends on the diameter of the graph, so the longest of these shortest paths. So once again, um, uh, that's, a, that's an example of an iterative graph algorithm that, that requires multiple if expressing my produce job, multiple jobs in a pipeline. So starting from these particular uh, points to be attacked, in 2010, Google introduced Bregel uh, as, a, as their own distributed graph processing framework. Um, it's based on a different parallel model instead of having MapReduce. Uh, it's based on BSP, the path synchronous parallel by Valence, introduced in 1990. It's a high-level model for writing parallel programs. It's not a technical description. It's nothing um, fairly, let's say, formal. But just a way we will see later to, to define uh, at high level how to write parallel programs. Uh, just like MapReduce, Pregel is oriented to batch processing. So uh, you would use Pregel or Giraffe if um, if you want to compute something on all your vertices, so you want to touch your graph multiple times, compared to situations where you would run a small query on a small part, uh, on a small portion of your graph, something that you might in real time maybe make to, to serve your front end, in which case you would probably work with the graph DB. So don't look, to look out for for breaking if you want something in real time. Uh, yes, just like just like with MapReduce, the designer of Breaker had wanted to the, wanted to provide the developers a very simple uh, API for writing parallel programs, so something that could hide the complexity of distribution and of fault tolerance and so on and so forth. But this time, instead of having an API based on mappers and reducer, we have uh, the, well, the designers require the, the developers to, to get into the perspective of being a vertex that can send and receive messages from other vertices and that have a value associated with it, as we will see later. So it has a different perspective, it's vertex-centric. You basically concentrate on a vertex, which is the so-called first citizen of the framework. Uh, the computation happens in memory, so you have, to, you have to be able to fit all your data in memory uh, across, your, across the cluster. Uh, it runs on all infrastructure, it is done at Google, at Google. And this infrastructure follows a master, typical master slave architecture, just like MapReduce. So this is a, uh, this is a diagram coming from Wikipedia that shows a little bit about this PSP uh, model. So we have um, <coughs> machines 
So this is time on the, on the Y and on the big dimension we have the machine. So of course it's a parallel model. We have multiple machines. You can imagine uh, uh, formally uh, and synchronization uh, and serial machines. We can think of CPUs or computers. So they basically have their own fast local memory and uh, access to a communication media where they can exchange messages. Uh, BSP uh, a BSP computation is based on a, on a sequence of super steps. This, uh, this, shows up, this shows one of the super steps. Uh, this super step, the so called super step, is uh, composed of three phases. So each of the machines receives uh, an input split of the problem, so a subset of the problem. It has to be dividable, of course, um, in order to be parallel. But um, so it loads this, da this data and, and starts running a computation according to the semantics of the algorithm on its own fast machines until this data, this computation is exhausted and each processing unit is able, uh, if required, to exchange messages. And we can imagine of this communication phase as being a, uh, a way of, of modeling shared uh, memory through a message passing API. At the end of this communication, so all, all these processing units have exchanged messages for, for, what it, for what they needed for. They stop at the global level at the barrier, barrier of synchronization, which is something like a very, we can think of as a shared semaphore. Where, well, while they wait for, for the long, longest lasting processing unit to finish, and then if, if, if globally the, the computation is not over, they can go on with the next super step. So we can think of this, of this, of this units as something we try to be very simple here. Uh, two, two states, a finite state automata, where basically they, they run a computation. <coughs> each of them, each of these processing units has a local view of the problem. So because he doesn't know whether the other processing units are over. So he doesn't have a global view of the algorithm. So at the end of the synchronization barrier, each of the processing units, depending on the fact they, they locally think it's over, they can, they can vote to halt the whole job. And so they, they get to the state where they halted, and if they receive a message in the next, for the next super step, they will they will switch back automatically to the active state because of the fact of receiving a messages a message or messages. Obviously, the state there is though, there is more work to be done. So there is just this uh, these two states you have to consider, and of course the whole job is finished when all the all the vertices have voted to halt. Obviously, making a global, uh, global decision. So let's have, let's have a look at an example, something like a word counting from MapReduce. We will have a look at the, this small graph, which is actually the one on top. Uh, it has four vertices and six edges, and the goal of, of this job is to compute the biggest value among those associated to the vertices. So as you can see, it's very easy, it's number six. So they all start, all the vertices start in active state, and they spread their value to their neighbor. So they go. They, they vote to halt at the end of that super step, and uh, as, we, as we see, the, the two vertices at, at the edges receive a vertex. They receive they receive the value number six, and they update accordingly. Uh, they, uh, of course, the algorithm is: yeah, I receive the messages from my neighbors. They own value. If, they, if they're bigger than mine, uh, I will update my value accordingly and spread it to my neighbors. Otherwise, they will just ignore it and, and, and vote to halt and stay halted. So that's why these vertices are updated. Number two still has the same number six because it's his neighbor just number one. So he thinks he's locally um, the biggest because he just received number one. That's why he's gray and it's going to split. But as long as number six is spreading, if I eventually gets to this vertex, we should also be able to update vertex number six. Well, that vertex which I cannot uh, uniquely identify, but. Basically, we, we get to this base to to this last step, to this last step where all of them have received number six, where they're not spreading uh, the, the value to anybody, so they, they keep in the halted state and the computation is over. It's very simple. It's about message passing and uh, and so on. So we said uh, that uh, Prager comes with a vertex centric API, which means that you are required to uh, extend. Um, a generic abstract class where you have where you have to define your <coughs> vertex index, so the way the, you, you can uniquely identify your vertex. Um, you can define the vertex value associated with each vertex, the, the value of the edge, which can be associated with the edge, and the value type. In particular, in, kind of in, a, in the case of giraffe, they have to be 
course, uh, writable, writable type, so serializable to uh, Hadoop, but that's not a requirement. Um, okay, so the first method is basically the, the, the method that has to be uh, extended in order to implement the algorithm. All the rest is API you can access. With the same the names are pretty simple. If you have ever worked with an API with wraps, you have to basically implement the compute method um, that just receives messages for that super step. You define a computation for that super step, and that's all. You can access your super step at the current super step. Your ID, your value can have access uh, to the neighbors, the list of versions you, uh, you have an outgoing edge to, and then you can send messages to, this, to these neighbors. It's very simple. Uh, just something more you can do is define, of course, the, the way you serialize and deserialize your graph, uh, just like typical MapReduce, MapReduce input or, or output format. You can define a combiner, just like MapReduce. So it's a, a combiner is a means of combining multiple, combining multiple messages into one to decrease the overhead of network communication. And then you can define an aggregator, where you, you can imagine uh, an aggregation function, something like a sum or an average, each, each vertex is a the aggregator is something global that um, to whom to whom vertices can send messages. So let's suppose I want to compute the average page rank value in my, in my graph. I define an aggregator that receives the page rank values coming from the vertices and it just have, just computes the average on this. Uh, and of course, we have um, a graph mediator API, which means that every vertex can request to add or remove edges or vertices during the computation. So the graph doesn't necessarily have to be static during the whole computation. So this is the simple example in pseudocode for the max value algorithm we have just seen. As you can see, it's 10 lines. We're just iterating through the messages. We are computing the biggest value in our messages values. And whether it's bigger than ours, we will set it ours accordingly and iterate through um, to the neighbor, the usage list, and send this new value to them. And eventually, in the end, in any case, go to halt. With 50 lines, page rank is, is, is as big as, as this code. You can imagine it's very <coughs> simple to write um, these kind of, let's say, algorithms. Uh, it follows a master slave architecture, so um, basically we have this big graph and we spread it across the workers. We have a master and workers. And the workers are those that have vertices assigned to them and run computations on them. So basically they compute the, the compute method. Uh, while the master is just a, a coordinator for the computation, so it's basically responsible for the synchronization barrier or uh, spreading the cross, assigning the, the vertices across the workers and aggregation and so on. Uh, how do you, how do we or do you uh, spread the vertices among the workers? Well, the first and, and most obvious way is some kind of random way. So you use a hash method, just like the way the shuffling is, is implemented in reduce, map reduce. So you you, write, you you compute the hash of the vertex index, <coughs> you compute the, the, the module over the number of workers, and you spread it through a hash partition. Or you can use a range partitioning, where you have, of course, a prefix on your vertex IDs, and you spread it according to the to this prefix. It's typical range partitioning. So, of course, this in giraffe in particular, the, the way to partition your graph is uh, pluggable, so you can write your own, but it just come out of the, out of the box. So, uh, we said um, that um, Giraffe and Bregel work on top of PSP. Uh, we said that PSP is um, it's based on super steps. So, the, the way the two things map together is that uh, each vertex end, have, ends up being one of these blue lines, one of these processing units, so it has a um, have local memory access to it and can send message to it. And that's basically the way the two models are mapped together. So the memory, I mean, the mapping comes automatically because you can send messages and wait for uh, and report to help, as we have seen in the API. So let's have a look at uh, exactly, exactly how a super step works in this kind of framework. This, this holds for, I guess, with, with Breaker as well. We haven't seen the code, but this is how it works with Giraffe. So we can think of one super step as one iteration of our algorithm. So we can think as super step as um, one of the map reduce jobs we've seen before in the iterative algorithm. So we start we start by loading the graph from HDFS. Uh, we assign the, ma the the master does that assigns sets partitions of workers to uh, partition of workers to workers. 
and of course the health of all the workers is collected and if all, if all the workers are up, we can start computing uh, the computer computer method over the vertices. So of course at the first super step there will no there will be no messages assigned to them, but uh, the idea is just you know you iterate to the vertices belonging to that worker. You just call the method compute method on the active nodes on the active vertices, and you compute the produced you collect the produced messages to be sent. It's very simple. It's just a for loop. Uh, what happens later is that the workers uh, have all these messages produced by the vertices assigned to them, and they exchange these messages automatically. Uh, the idea is that these messages, uh, these, these messages are sent directly from workers to workers, so they're not passing to the master. That's that's a performant uh, issue. Let's say well. It's, it's, it's a good way to make it performant. Uh, and so the messages are exchanged and the aggregators are computed. And um, that's also quite parallel, meaning that the workers are computing the aggregation on the method on the vertices assigned to them. And then the work, the, the, these, these aggregated values from the workers get to the master who aggregates them again. So uh, also the aggregators are also uh, they are global. They are computed in parallel. Um, and last point I have an, um, Talking about it yet, <coughs> we have a checkpointing for fault tolerance. Okay, if this happens again, uh, of course, uh, also in the, in the following super steps. Well, of course, we're avoiding loading uh, the graph, but the rest keeps the same. Uh, but we can also end up having to load the graph again in uh, in the following super step in case a fault happens. So, if, as we will see later, as a, as a fault happens. The, the master will realize that and will ask the workers to uh, to load the, the latest checkpoint. So it will happen to load the, to touch to touch the graph again, but just for full tolerance. So these are basically four points. Uh, I mentioned before uh, at the end of the uh, of the, the slides about MapReduce, and this are these are point by point the, the answer from Pregel to uh, the issues. That uh, how to say emerge from from using MapReduce for iterative graph algorithms. So, uh, by the fact that it's a stateful computation, by the fact that super step after super step, we're not spilling the disk, we're not uh, losing the, the information might be memorable, but we keep it super step after super step. Uh, of course, we avoid hitting the disk for uh, unloading and loading the graph, which is of course not by all. Uh, in fact, we touch the disk just for checkpointing. So, if if you don't if you don't want checkpoint. We, uh, as a matter of fact, it's uh, user-defined, you can also avoid checkpointing, you're not touching the disk at all during the whole computation. Uh, the sorting is avoided in a super step, there is no sorting happening. And the only thing that you're sending along the network is the messages you're sending. So the static part of the graph, which is kept in memory being stateful, is not touching the network at all. This is the reason why uh, Perego is, is so much faster than MapReduce. Um, so let's have a look at what, what our options are for um, using Bregel out there right now from today. Uh, we have actually currently a few options. Uh, one of them is Giraffe, one is Hema, one is Golden Orb, and Signal Collect. Um, I will talk <coughs> now specifically about Giraffe. But as I said, the Bregel model is at the basis for the four of them. Uh, so this is, this is a common part. Uh, the other common part is that the, at least the three, the, the first three, Leverage some some more some less the the underneath Hadoop cluster. In particular, Heyman Goldenorb use Zookeeper for uh, synchronization better for holding state uh, about the whole computation. They use HDFS for loading and unloading and checkpointing, and they use um, Hadoop RPC for communication. The interest, the what I find well, the, the, the thing that makes them different is that they, both Hema and Golden Orb require uh, you to deploy to your cluster additional software. You can think of them such as the their own task tracker. So you need to install more software to maintain they they go their own. While Giraffe, on the other side, uh, leverages 100% your existing cluster. So you have your Hadoop cluster and you just can run your program without um, adding any additional software. We were incubated since. In summer, it was a project uh, originally uh, donated by Yahoo. It's all completely written in Java. It, um, <coughs> it implements the uh, basically the regular API coming from the paper. 
uh, which is actually makes a difference from the HEMA project I forgot to talk about. Uh, HEMA doesn't implement uh, the Bregel API, but implements the, uh, the BSP machine we've seen. So it, it provides the primitives for a BSP <coughs> machine, so some message passing and a barrier. But it doesn't have a vertex center API. It does, you have to basically you have to write, you can write uh, Giraffe or Bregel as an application on top of uh, HEMA. This is the big difference, with, another big difference between the three. We are providing just a golden, golden of the Bregel API. We run on existing MapReduce and we have a fairly active community with uh, committers coming from big companies. Uh, so we said, uh, the, well, the reason why I chose the Giraffe is in particular because uh, it leverages 100% your existing cluster. We are, in the, in the end, technically speaking, just a MapReduce job. Uh, it runs, although it's in you know, it's MapReduce, so we're, we're so used to having this sun-based computation. It runs on memory, so it's a bit of a hack or a smart thing. Uh, but the good thing about being 100% MapReduce job, it means that we can basically have our draft computation inside of a normal pipeline of MapReduce job. So you can, I can imagine having your web logs coming from HDFS, you can filter them out, creating something like a graph, which can work, which you, for which you can use uh, Giraffe to run your graph computation, emit some kind of data that can be later be fed to a hive for analytics. So it comes automatically and smoothly. Um, yes. Can you give some live example on where the Giraffe could